Uh, my name is Dr. Robert Lewis. Um, some of you may know me. Um, I'm the director of the Skull Base and Pituitary Program here at Hoag. So I'm a neurosurgeon. Uh, came here about four years ago um, after doing my, uh, my fellowship in minimally invasive brain tumor surgery and pituitary surgery uh, at John Wayne Cancer Institute. So I was recruited here to start up the program. And one of the things I've been kind of tasked with uh, here at Hoag is uh, to bring uh, emerging neurotechnologies uh, to our, our patient population here in Newport Beach. Um, we're fortunate to be in a very um, uh, well-positioned and well-supported hospital, and so uh, we have uh, the ability to bring unique uh, techniques and technologies uh, to our patients here at Hogue. And so I'm going to be talking to you about uh, some of those technologies today, how we uh, use them across the neurosurgical patient care continuum, as well as how some of these technologies uh, are expanded into other areas of healthcare, and how we might be bringing those to Hogue here as well. So. I do have some relevant financial disclosures. I'm a consultant uh, for surgical theater, which is one of the technologies I'm going to be talking about. Um, a couple of other non-relevant uh, financial disclosures as well. Uh, so just a bit of a, of a historical perspective, neurosurgery is a relatively young field. Um, it was 1885 that was the first reported case of history of surgery for a brain tumor. This was in England. Um, so in 2010, it was the 125th anniversary of this. And this tumor was localized and resected entirely based on the patient's symptoms. So this is before CT or MRI, but they knew based on animal models and human accidents and trauma uh, that the patient had a weakness of the left hand and arm, that there must be a problem or a tumor in the right motor cortex in the central sulc near the central sulcus. So based on animal models and the patient's symptoms alone, they were able to successfully localize the tumor as to where it was in the brain. They drew a couple of lines on the skull. We call these nowadays taylor Houghton lines. We don't use them at all anymore because we have much more advanced uh, methods of localizing tumors. But uh, they were able to successfully um, drill a couple of small holes in the patient's head, remove a piece of bone, and actually successfully remove the tumor. Um, the patient ended up dying because this is before antibiotics were discovered. This is in the 1880s. Um, but the, it was important in that it was the first time in human history that we were found, it was discovered that you're able to successfully intervene on the human brain. Uh, and the hope was that it, under more favorable operating conditions, we would be able to offer lifelong benefit or lasting benefit to the patient. So uh, fast forward 125 years, I use this kind of tongue in cheek. This is the quote, modern era of neurosurgery. Most neurosurgical procedures in most centers throughout the country are still doing what I call old school neurosurgery, where uh, they go in and get the tumor out, but it requires removing half of the patient's skull, uh, and they're left horribly disfigured by these huge um, incisions. And so I call it maximally invasive or old school neurosurgery. Um, and um, that's not the way we need to do things anymore, that we live in an era of rapidly advancing technology, uh, and these technologies can be applied to make our field, whatever our field of, of medicine is uh, better, more precise, and, and better able to help the patient. So again, this is one of the areas I'm actively involved in in neurosurgery, and particularly here at Hogue. It's one of the reasons I was brought here. And so um, you know, one of the things we work on is pairing technological advances to, uh, to neurosurgery. So uh, in the last 20 years, neurosurgery has been gifted with significant advances that have made our science uh, more precise uh, and better able to, to take care of patients. So one of the major advances is something called navigation. Not unlike navigation in your car, this uses a, a 3D tracking system to tr optically track the tips of our instruments and tell us where we are in relation to the patient's anatomy and pathology. So that was a big advance forward. Another one is uh, the idea of using a port uh, to cannulate into a certain area of the brain. Now this is something Thing we borrowed from general surgeons. They're using ports to, to access the abdomen to take out the appendix or the gallbladder for a long time. Uh, but uh, only in the last couple of years have we started to use these in neurosurgery. And we found that they are ideally suited for neurosurgery because they allow us to work through a small channel, remove the tumor, but not disturb the surrounding brain. Uh, refined instrumentation is something we're constantly working on. So if we're going to create a smaller portal to work through, well, we've got to create instruments to work into that portal with. And so that's something that's, that's come up in the last few years. Ultrasound is another area where we have borrowed technology from another field of medicine. In this case, the obstetricians have been using ultrasound in the abdomen you know, for 50 years or more. And only in the last couple of years have we started to use it in neurosurgery. 
And these types of examples are ways in which our egos, I mean, anybody that knows neurosurgeons knows we have big egos. We think a lot of ourselves. Some of us think of ourselves as gods, and um, inappropriately so, because it's blinding. Having a big ego prevents you from learning from other fields of medicine. In the case of endoscopy, general surgeons have been using the, the laparoscopes, you know, cameras in the belly to remove the appendix and the gallbladder for more than 50 years. And we've always been like, well, that's okay for the general surgery guys, but that's not brain surgery. You know, we, we're better than them. Well, it turns out we're totally wrong about that, that once neurosurgeons adopted to the idea that the endoscope is ideally suited for, for surgery within the brain because it allows us to go in through a small portal and disrupt less tissue, that once we started using that, um, that we were able to do these operations through smaller and smaller approaches. Uh, this picture of the optic chiasm shows these little vessels on the surface of the optic chiasm are a tenth of a millimeter, in, a tenth of a millimeter in diameter. Nowhere else in the body does a vessel of that size matter, but on the chiasm, it means that if you bipolar one or tear one, they're going to have a small spot, black spot, or even a large one uh, in their vision, depending on the size of the vessel. So when we were able to put our egos aside and recognize that an endoscopy and the ultrasound and using ports are great ideas for neurosurgery, uh, then we're able to really advance the science forward rapidly. Now, this uh, you know, is just a, an illustration which we kind of uh, is a proof of concept of the idea of using endoscopy, whereas a standard operating microscope, you, the, the source of light and the camera is outside of the field of view, so th the amount of visualization you get is limited by the size of your craniotomy. It's, it's funneled down, and so you only see what's in directly in your line of sight. Comparatively, when you use an endoscope, if you introduce the camera through the opening, it allows you to use a small opening in the skull, and if you introduce your light source and your camera or your rod lens in, you can see everything that's on the other side. So this is uh, a, a view of the third ventricle. So this is inside the, 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 the um, ventricular system. This is the foramen of Monroe, which we're actually looking down in, into a tumor on the, uh, in, the, in the third ventricle here. This is choroid plexus. You can see how beautifully defined the anatomy is just by using an endoscope. This is a four millimeter endoscope, which instead of doing a, you know, an operation to remove half the patient's skull and get into the third ventricle, we're able to do this through a four millimeter working port and remove these tumors uh, through a very small incision and small opening in the brain. Uh, so it isn't, it, isn't, it isn't entirely true that we could have just used the endoscopes from 50 years ago in order to do neurosurgery. Some of it did require the technology to catch up. Uh, so this is just a slide showing you know, standard 480p, which is standard definition, versus the current endoscopes that we use um, are, are 4K, uh, which if you're comparing, you know, would you want your surgeon to be looking at the pathology that they're operating on based on this ability to visualize or based on using true you know, 4K HD on the right here. It's kind of a, you know, no pun intended, it's kind of a no-brainer um, to, to say, okay, obviously in order to be able to do these operations on very tiny structures, uh, we need to have the best camera technology available. So that's finally, uh, again, one of these tools that's in, in our hands. All of these things coming together have kind of led to this concept of keyhole surgery or removing tumors through smaller, more precise openings, which allows us to minimize the damage to brain, scalp, muscle. All of those things were previously thought by the neurosurgeon just to be in the way. Like, you know, this patient's scalp is in the way, the skull is in the way. Uh, I just need to get to the brain. So we would remove literally half the skull uh, in order to get there. Well, that was for a couple of reasons. Number one, we didn't really know any better. And number two, uh, we didn't have the technology to precisely target the lesions. But now combining the navigation technology with endoscopic technology, we're able to do these, small, these same operations through what's the equivalent of an opening in the skull the size of a nickel, uh, which is pretty incredible that we're able to kind of make that far of an advance just in the last 10 years. So. The endoscopic endonasal approach, or going through the nose to get to tumors in the center of the head, around the pituitary, the cellar region, the carotids, um, this is a, you know, the, kind of the poster child of keyhole neurosurgery. It, we do have to give a little bit of credit to the ancient Egyptians. It isn't a modern concept to a recognize that you can get to the brain by going up through the nose. It was the process of mummification that led us to recognize this in the first place, that sticking a hot pro poker up the nose and into the brain allows it to liquefy the brain and drain it out. Um, so they deserve the original credit for the first transphenoidal operation. Um, 
Another example of keyhole surgery is something called a supraorbital or eyebrow craniotomy. So again, instead of taking this big incision across the top of the head we remove the, and removing the front half of the skull, I'll make an incision that's hidden in the eyebrow and make a hole in the, in the skull the size of a quarter. Uh, and uh, it's the, the results for the patient. You know, this is how we do it. This is what it looks like. And in, this is for the same type of tumor. So for a craniopharyngioma, this is the way it would have been done before. This patient had a bone flap infection and lost their frontal bone essentially bilaterally. And this woman had a craniopharyngioma as well. And you can barely see that, yeah, maybe her eyebrow is a little bit more thinned out on this side, but to be able to do this operation through this approach uh, is what technology, is what these technologies that we're talking about uh, affords us. It allows us to be more precise and therefore less invasive in, in performing these operations. So um, this is an example of what we're, some of the stuff we're going to be talking about. So you know, any of you that have looked at MRIs and CT scans, as a surgeon, looking at a CT scan or an MRI in kind of these cross sections, these you know, orthogonal planes, forces the surgeon to view the patient's anatomy through a radiologist's point of view. In reality, at the time of surgery, the patient's head isn't perfectly perpendicularly oriented to the floor, and I don't get to look at it in cross sections while I'm operating on it. I have to look at it, you know, their head is extended back and they're kind of turned 30 degrees and I'm sneaking in upside down and backwards. So we've, up until this point, been forced to kind of interpolate what we see on the MRI and then transition that into what we're planning to do for surgery. Now, with virtual reality and augmented t reality technology, we're able to actually rehearse and plan and navigate the operation using a 3D model, which allows us to put the patient in the same position as they would be at surgery. So this is also an idea that was adopted from another field of science. In this case, the military. It was two Israeli fighter pilots that came up with the idea of you know what? We Fighter pilots, when they're rehearsing for a mission, they think about it, they plan what they're going to do, and then they go in the actual flight simulator, and in virtual reality, they simulate what they're going to do. They fly through the city that they're going to bomb, and they look at where the targets are going to be, where the enemies are going to be, where there could be potential problems. Well, until recently, surgeons were unable to do that. We had to kind of, our rehearsal for an operation was sitting and having coffee and thinking about, okay, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to come to the carotid artery, and then it's going to be a little bit up and to the left. Well, that process of kind of mental rehearsal is intrinsically error prone because our rehearsal of the anatomy is based on our memory of one idealized patient, which we learned about in medical school, which is this is what their anatomy looks like. It, in other words, it doesn't allow the anatomy to be tailored to this particular operation. It's just based on memory. When you use virtual reality, we're able to reconstruct each patient's anatomy in 3D and allow us to rehearse, literally putting on a headset and rehearse in 3D and go through the operation and see where the important arteries are going to be, see where the carotid is going to be, see where the optic nerve is going to be in order to avoid those structures at the time of surgery. So I'm just going to, th this brings up the topic of uh, mediated reality technology and that's kind of what the talk is about today. Um, there's essentially two main areas of mediated reality technology uh, with regards to healthcare. There's virtual reality, which is a completely computer simulated recreation of an environment. So you put on a headset and you have no ability to see the outside world. So the, the, the headset or the system replicates your presence in whatever environment you're trying to recreate. In this case, we're trying to simulate the surgeon's experience in this person's head while operating on the brain tumor. That's a virtual reconstruction. Augmented reality takes those same computer generated models and then adds them back in to your live view of the world. So the best example of augmented reality we have today is, is navigation while you're driving. So you're getting in on your main through the windshield, you're seeing what you know, you're, the road ahead of you, but then either on your screen or on a pop-up display, you're having additional information fed to you from the computer, where your target is, where, where you're trying to get to, where the traffic is gonna be. That information is augmenting or adding to your ability Ability to understand the world ahead of you. So it adds in additional information that you're unable to perceive on your own. So it improves your ability to, to do the job better. So these things are well established. VR and AR are kind of well established in other fields of science. Kids playing video games have had VR technology for more than a decade and they have a blast with it. And when I got into neurosurgery, I kind of, once I was through the training, I, I was like, well, 
why aren't we using things like you know, virtual reality? Like why, it seems like the technology of medicine is lagging behind technology and military and gaming. Uh, and some of it is, again, because of ego. People refuse to adopt new technologies. And some of it is because the technology really did need to catch up. Um, but the benefits of VR and AR are, are pretty widespread. I'm going to talk initially about the benefits in the neurosurgical care, care continuum. And then we're going to talk about some wider spread applications, which can help us with a lot of other things. So for neurosurgery, the, be the, the benefits of VR and AR are throughout the patient care continuum. We use VR for planning for surgery. So before the operation, I take the patient's MRI, I load it into the surgical theater system. I do a 3D rehearsal of the operation. So I put on the headset, I have virtual tools that I use. Okay, I'm going to drill a little bit here. That'll get me to the optic nerve. Okay, another millimeter or two forward, then I'm going to come to the carotid. So I can literally rehearse each patient's operation, and I do before I go in there. The degree of safety that that alone adds is multiplied by the fact that it not only allows me to rehearse the operation I'm planning on doing, it allows me to try a couple of different approaches. And I'm going to show a video that shows sometimes, you know, we think that we're going to be able to get to the tumor through the nose, but in reality, the co surgical corridor doesn't allow it. So I can try two or three different operations in the VR space, whereas previously I would have just had to make a decision and go with it, and that patient was stuck with whatever the outcome was. Now, because of this ability to rehearse prior, I'm able to decrease the chances that I'm going to do a wrong or incomplete operation on the patient. We also use it for patient engagement. So as a patient, looking at a 2D MRI is even more difficult to understand than it is for a, for a physician or surgeon. So I'm scrolling through a coronal MRI and the patient looks at it and is like, yeah, okay, doc, whatever, you know, I trust you, just go for it. Well, that's not kind of really the understanding we want. The, it is known that the more educated our patients are, that the better they understand their own condition, number one, the more likely they are to come back to us and, and have the surgery here, here under our care, but also they're more likely to have a better outcome because they have a better understanding of what's going on with their own bodies. Um, so we're going to talk about how we use it for patient engagement. Uh, intraoperative navigation, we're going to go into how we use augmented reality in the operating room to allow us to kind of uh, real-time check what we're seeing versus what we think we should be seeing and to tell us we're in the right place uh, during the surgery. Community outreach, uh, we use virtual reality all across the, 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 um, the community. Um, recently, I, I went to, a, I do a medical residency day at a local school. Uh, the sixth graders have a, a, a medical residency day, and instead of going to them and talking to them and showing slides about the brain, I bring the virtual reality system in there, and the kids get to put on a headset, and they're flying through the brain, and they're getting to see where the arteries are, just to get kids in the community excited about being physicians. It's hard to get kids motivated, and a lot of physicians nowadays are kind of discouraging our youth from becoming physicians. I'm trying to counteract that at least for neurosurgery. There's a little bit of history behind that. When I was in sixth grade, I had a neurosurgeon bring a cadaver brain into my school. I thought it was the coolest thing. And 25 years you know, of training later, that's what I decided to do. So I'm trying to get that out there. And using virtual reality is a good tool for that. It's hard to bring a cadaver brain nowadays into a sixth grade science classroom. There's a lot of regulatory things we, we have to jump through. But I can bring the VR system. And then we're talking to these kids in the language they understand. They already play video games with VR. So they put on a headset and it's like nothing, except now they're learning and they're inside the brain and they get excited about it. And maybe we can you know, turn one of them into to, to want to become a physician or a neurosurgeon. Uh, and then for education and collaboration. So again, you know, many of you went to a, a medical school and residency in an era where there may have been little or no oversight in general surgery residency and uh, my residency. You know, the tendings didn't come in in the middle of the night. We just did the operation and reported them in the morning. Uh, well, that's no longer accepted in the modern culture. So we have to find other ways to train residents on complex procedures and how to do them to ensure that they finish residency and are still ready to go by the time their seven years are completed. Well, virtual reality is a great way to do that because it simulates their presence within an, an environment. It doesn't replace operative skills, but it can replace certain or accelerate certain learning curves. For example, the three-dimensional understanding of the heart or the lungs, or the brain, or the liver. Uh, it's hard to get a 3D understanding looking at 2D slices. When you put on a headset, and you can actually look at it in 3D, and you can spin the liver around. Okay, there, you know, this is the, okay, I understand how the IVC drains in now. It accelerates the learning curve uh, for, for medical students and residents. So that's another way we're, we're applying this to healthcare training. 
So this is an example of, of a case where we use the preoperative navigation. Based on the 2D preoperative navigation, this is a cellar tumor, a cellar meningioma. And if you look at this, it'd be a great case for a transphenoidal to go through the nose. So that's kind of what I was planning initially, is to go through the nose to remove this. However, when I loaded it into the 3D system, I tried to do a transphenoidal operation. I rehearsed the operation. So this is, you know, you saw the 2D models. Now this is the 3D model of what we see. So you're looking at, you know, it's very intuitively obvious when you look at this. Yeah, there's the patient's teeth. There's the nasal cavity. And you can see as we're kind of tracking up, I'm able to see what I would be able to see using a VR approach and going at this through the nose. Well, what I discovered when I was approaching this going through, the, through a transnasal endoscopic transphenoidal route is that when I looked at it and looked carefully at the 3D model, I found out that I wasn't going to be able to get to one of the, a the aspects of the tumor over here to the side. So this is the, this is the optic nerve here and the carotid artery. And there's a little tongue of tumor that kind of hangs over the carotid artery that I would not be able to get at by going through the nose. So what this allowed is for me to simulate that surgical corridor, look at where the position of the optic nerves and carotid artery are, and realize that for this patient in, with this tumor, the transphenoidal route was not the best way to go. Instead of making that mistake on a patient, I made it on a virtual patient and was able to try another approach. So I said, you know what, let's take a look and see what the supraorbital, what the eyebrow craniotomy gives us, and see if that approach is going to allow us to, to re remove the tumor. And sure enough, by coming from above in this patient, we're able to get to the tumor, come straight down on top of the tumor, and be able to take it out on top of the optic nerve and optic chiasm and carotid artery without injuring those things. Now maybe you could say that a more, an experienced surgeon, somebody that's been doing this 20 years, might have known that just from the 2D DICOM MRI. But that just further reinforces the utilization or the utility of this uh, in, in training younger surgeons, residents, because it allowed me to see okay, you know what, this isn't going to work for this patient. It allowed me to explain to the patient why, because she came in okay, expecting the tumor to be removed through her nose. So I had to show her this model and explain to her, you know what, we're coming, if we come in through the nose, we can take out 90% of it, but there'll be 10% of the tumor left, which I can't get to. If I just had to explain that to the patient, they would maybe be like, well, maybe this guy just doesn't want to do it. When I show them the 3D model, they recognize it's very obvious, okay, this, I can see that this corridor, the tumor over here is outside of your surgical corridor and you won't be able to get to it. So it makes sense that you're going to need to do um, the operation through a through an eyebrow approach. They actually studied this at Mount Sinai in New York, uh, and they, did, they took cases, and made an, the, the attending surgeon made an initial plan based on the 2D images, and then blinded, the, um, they made a plan based on the 3D images. And 24% of the time, using the VR led to a change in the surgical plan for approach. In other words, it added additional information that said, you know what, this isn't the best approach for this patient, I think we should do it another other way. When you think about that, in other terms, that means 24% of the time they were potentially going to do the incorrect or not optimal operation for the patient because they didn't have all the information available. They were only using 2D images to make the plan. That's a substantial margin for error. And so uh, the value that that affords to the patients in, in giving a couple of options before we actually do the surgery uh, it really, I think, saves in, in patient, you know, having to have further surgery for, for further tumor removal, as well as um, potential neurologic complications. So one of the other ways we found th this to be useful, as I said, is in, is in patient engagement. So we know when we talk to patients um, about surgery, a lot of them don't really understand what we're talking about. Even if we're fairly good at you know, speaking on different levels, they still, many of them come back and they're like, you know what, I, I don't really get it, but I trust you, you seem like a decent guy, I've read about you online, and, and just go for it. That's not really what we want. We want patients to, when they leave our office, understand what it is we plan to do and why. And so we started doing these virtual consultations prior to surgery with patients. Well, this is what we found. Before I was doing VR consultations, 64% of the patients that I recommended surgery to would actually have surgery with me, meaning the other 36% would go up to UCLA or Cedars-Sinai or, or, or um, USC. That's a substantial loss of patients. You know, that, that must be that I either didn't explain to them correctly or they heard something about this guy at UCLA or they heard something about Cedars-Sinai that they think they can get you know, better treatment there. 
So when we started doing VR, we initially started with the gray bar here of these are the patients would not get their own case in VR, but they would get a similar indexed library case. Well, I'm going to show you a case of a transphenoidal operation just to show you what it's like. This isn't your case, but you know, it, it's close. When we did that alone, the, re the retention rate went to 82%, meaning instead of, six, instead of 36%, now only 18% of our patients are leaving to go up to, uh, to other centers. When we did, started doing individualized patient-specific reconstructions, so now the patient comes in, I load their MRI into the system, I, instead of explaining to them on using anatomy textbooks and these kind of things, I fly them through their own brain uh, using VR. Now our retention rate is 96%, so meaning only 4% of patients now are leaving here to go elsewhere to have their surgery because they leave the office and they get it. They understand what's going on. It's pretty obvious when you look at that, yeah, the tumor is in green. My five-year-old daughter's like, yeah, that to the green thing, that's what I don't want, right? So it's easy for us to see why if patients feel more engaged, they feel more educated about their condition, they're li more likely to stay here and have care uh, with us. Um, the other advantage to this is that Sometimes I'm delivering to these patients what may be the worst news of their life, that they have a brain tumor. And it's terrible. It's, it's a difficult thing and they're in shock. In some ways, we use the technology as a distraction from that, that you know what, you, you have this condition, but we've got it. We've got a plan. We've got all these technologies to help make it better for you. And in some ways, we've also found in addition to their understanding of the condition, it takes away some of the fear because they at least feel like, okay, well, I'm in a good place to, to be able to, to get care for this. And my surgeon has a plan and I understand the plan so that they feel better going into it. Um, so this, is, this was actually a surprise benefit of the technology. We didn't predict this. It's just something we started testing. And sure enough, it, we found it to be true. So going from the preoperative arena where we use it to plan and rehearse and engage patients, we take it into the operating room. And this is when we transition from virtual reality into what's called augmented reality. So this is what I was talking about with the heads up display in a car. You know, this can either be projected onto a screen or onto the windshield where, you know, you, you may be lost anywhere. You don't, you know, you don't know where you are. Well, 20 years ago, you had to pull over, pull out a map, look at the map. Okay, here's where I am. Now you just speak, okay, uh, you know, Siri, find me, you know, the uh, Nixon library. 10 seconds later, the directions pop up and it's guiding you in 50 feet turn left and it's with arrows on the screen to tell you which direction. So it's a lot harder to get lost when you have technology like that navigating you through. And this is, again, augmenting your ability to understand the world. This, again, is based on flight, flight technology. So fighter pilots, when they're flying, they have a monocle that tells them what altitude they're at, what, you know, where, what, where the targets are, where the potential dangers are. So that information is added into their live view to increase their understanding of the world. So this is an example of how we use augmented reality technology in the operating room. So uh, this is going to be a, a pituitary surgery case. So we're looking, uh, we look initially at the 2D. This is a 68-year-old male presenting with pituitary tumor, presented with a standard loss of vision by temporal hemianopsia. This is the tumor here, which we see in gray. Again, if you're not a surgeon or a neurosurgeon or a radiologist, you look at these and be like, okay, yeah, I get that. I get it. That's where the tumor is. Well, when, you, when, you, when we load it into the 3D system and then we can navigate based on that, you can see how this is the live surgical view on the left. This is a 3D reconstruction of the patient's uh, images on the right. So you can see how well they match up so that when I can't see in here, it's full of blood, I can no see exactly where the tumor is and the targeting information. I can see where the optic nerves are in green. And so it doesn't really look like much on the side on the left, but very clearly here I'm looking at the tumor and importantly, I can see what I can't see. Never in this video will I be able to visualize with the camera my, the optic nerves or where they are. But I can overlay the virtual image onto the, the actual uh, camera image, and so I can see what I'm looking at. So now I've removed most of the tumor, and so I catch up on the model. I remove most of the tumor on the virtual model. And what I'm looking at here is this cyst up inside the tumor, which is this little cyst here. You can see how well the, the pro projection matches to the live surgical video. What you can also see is that these optic nerves in green are out of my field of view here. I can't see where they are. But based on this augmented reality view, I can tell where they are and therefore I know where they are in order to be able to protect them. In order to be able to do this operation safely, there's no way to do that and see, up there, see inside there and see where those optic nerves are. But adding the augmented reality in allows me to know where the danger spots are, to know what, where the, the 
tumor is and to be able to com completely and safely resect this tumor and have a better outcome for the patient. What it leads to though, a little bit of a problem with visualization. So when you look at this, you're either looking at the left side of the screen or the right side of the screen. It's difficult to look at both at the same time because you, our eyes are not trained like that. So I wondered, how do the pilots do it? How do fighter pilots do it? Because they were able to in simultaneously interpret binocular information separately in both eyes. So I turned out, I asked around a little bit and NASA has a training program uh, to do this. And so I hooked up with the neurophysiologist that does this with NASA and I actually I actually did three days a week EEG-based biofeedback training to train myself to separately interpret you know, binocular information. So getting the targeting information from one eye and the live surgical information from the other eye. I did a ta a something called a split attention tasks and it was biofeedback using EEG on my own brain. And this is the color maps here, which is showing the baseline. You can see the lack of co coherence here, uh, lots of black. And when you get to after nine months, you can see how it's separately interpreted information in one hemisphere versus the other, which allows me to simultaneously see the targeting information from one screen and the live view of the surgery in the other screen. So this is something that took quite a lot of time to develop, uh, but I think it was a very useful skill uh, because it finally is allowing us to arrive at this area of precision neurosurgery where um, after 125 years of advancements, we are finally getting to the place where neurosurgery can be done with fewer and fewer complications with an approach that's tailored to each patient. You know, it used to be that there's kind of five or six standard craniotomies that we do. Okay, this is going to be a frontal, this is going to be a parietal, this is going to be a suboccipital. Well, now each patient gets a specific craniotomy that is only as big as it's necessary to remove that particular patient's tumor. And most of the cases, they're the, the size, the smaller than the size of a quarter. So, this kind of transitions the talk from the uh, effect, the usages of virtual reality in neurosurgery um, to virtual reality in other areas of medicine. So um, it is predicted that by 2020, um, VR in healthcare will be uh, eight to ten billion dollar industry. Um, that uh, the United States uh, owns more than three fifths of the market share for that, um, and that uh, in addition to the United States, Asia is a rapidly growing uh, area for for growth of VR and AR in healthcare. Um, that there are many, many fields uh, within uh, medicine that can benefit. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of these, uh, particularly for pain control, as well as for rehabilitation, um, virtual reality assistance for patients to coach them through how to take their medications, when to take their medications, to check in with them to make sure they're doing things on time. Uh, this is going to be replacing a lot of the busy work that doctors do that we're kind of some, and, and filling in some of these holes that occupy a lot of our time that could be done by a virtual assistant. So, um, it, it, you know, surveying doctors, eight out of 10 doctors believe that this year, um, virtual assistants will be in, in, in use in some way uh, to help patients, uh, interact, interactions with patients and help them understand their uh, health records. Um, that there's several kind of top areas for targeting that virtual uh, assistance will be useful for, um, particularly improving the patient's um, ability to navigate the EHR, uh, to navigate their diagnosis. There are modules that the patients can take home with them that coach them through basic you know, physical therapy exercises they do at home, that coach them through taking their medication that they can check in with throughout the day, uh, that can integrate information from their blood pressure and heart rate sensors, um, that uh, uh, adding in wearable technology into this adds the stream of available information that's, that, that can be utilized by these virtual assistants, uh, that anything from sleep sensors to um, modified interpret EEG to smart glasses to heart rate and blood pressure sensors, EKGs, um, insulin pumps, fitness monitors, all of these things are going to be taking the information from the patient, integrating it, having the information analyzed by machine learning and artificial intelligence, and then feeding back to the patient so that you know, they're walking through their day in a virtual you know, a physician pops up and says, hey, Mr. Smith, you know, I noticed that your blood sugar is running a little high today. Have you been doing anything out of the ordinary with your diet? Well, actually, yeah, I had that candy bar after lunch. Okay, well, maybe for the rest of the day, try to be extra careful about avoiding those things so that you, know, you don't run into a problem of your diabetes getting out of control. That's just a small example of, of how these things can be used to kind of coach and counsel patients through what would otherwise require a physician to do. And you know, maybe they had a couple of bad days and then they see a physician a month later and they've forgotten about it. Maybe that the patient, you know, their problem is um, drug addiction and they're having a hard time. You know, and today might be the day where they, they end up relapsing. 
counseling. But instead of, you know, instead of having to, uh, you know, try to get in with their physician or the doctor a month later, they check in with their virtual assistant. You know what? I'm having a really hard time today. I'm, I'm thinking about using. Well, what, you know, let, let's sit down and talk about that. And, and we will get to the point literally where a virtual assistant will be able to kind of offer some basic coaching. You know what? You've been in this place before and all, let's, let's just talk about making it through the next half an hour. Why don't you, instead of doing that, why don't you go to the, the beach and take a walk? And it'll give you kind of something, some, something for them to grab onto. So these things are all very much in play and going to be coming into use in the next five years. Um, the, um, there are some challenges in incorporating some of these things into the healthcare market. Um, one of the challenges with wearables is the amount of information that comes in. If you have a patient recording a patient's even heart rate data alone, and they get, you know, say a thousand heart rate measurements during the day, well, is that volume of information really useful? And where do we, how do we use it? Well, no, no human can interpret that amount of information. It requires, you know, machine learning. It requires, you know, significant processing power to take that data, interpret it, and come up with some meaningful uh, utility to it. So that's a challenge, the amount of data. Um, the um, patients, you know, HIPAA, the HIPAA is a concern. Patients are concerned about um, the ex- exposing potentially sensitive personal data. My response to this is a little bit, you know, well, you, everybody nowadays walks around with a with smartphone and your banking information is on your phone. Your 401k, your stocks, and someone takes your phone, they could, you know, sell all your stocks or, or, or get into your bank account. So are you more concerned that someone knows if they get your phone that you have cholesterol or high cholesterol? Or are you more concerned about your bank account information? If it's me, I don't care if everybody knows I have high cholesterol. If someone steals my phone and finds out I have high cholesterol, that's not my primary concern. I'm more concerned that they have access to my retirement accounts and my banking information. So I don't understand the, the reluctance to, for personal health information to be stored on, on cell phones when we have no problem storing financial information on cell phones. It could be passworded and protected with the fingerprint just like everything else. So I think, but th- there is a scare about that and, and, and many people are afraid to do it. And I, I, I guess I understand theoretically why, but you know, if you, if you kind of look at all the other things that are stored on our phones, why is he- your health information, you know, why are we reticent to do that when I would much rather be able to show up at a hospital and they pull a card out of my pocket or pull my phone out of my pocket and they plug it into the EMR and they say, oh yeah, this patient's unconscious, but it turns out they have adrenal insufficiency. Let's give them some hydrocortisone without ever having to talk to anybody in the family. Like we, they, know, they could know what's wrong with you just by swiping uh, or scanning in your, in your phone. I mean, that, that kind of technology already exists. We're just not putting it into play because of the HIPAA concerns. So I think that's somewhere where the culture of that needs to go a little bit in the other direction. We've got this huge you know, re- regulatory concern. Like everybody's afraid that everyone's going to find out that they have high cholesterol. I actually don't care if anyone finds out I have high cholesterol. You know, I'm happy to tell you if you ask me. There's a few sensitive diagnoses. Obviously, mental health issues are a different story. But the majority of, of health conditions, you'd much rather your doctor know about the information and be able to access it at any time than have that information be private from, ever, from, from whoever's looking at it. So I think that we need to kind of you know, get the education out there that you know what, it may be better off that some of this information is shared and available. I want to finish the talk by talking about a couple of specific technologies which, um, which we're going to be looking at bringing here to Hogue. One of the big pushes, um, you know, the, the Neurosciences Institute uh, was fortunate uh, in the last year, you may have seen some of it in the news, that, uh, to receive an enormous gift uh, from the Pickup family of $15 million to fund neurosciences into the next decade. And so uh, we're really blessed to have supporters like that here at Hogue, and um, we're grateful to the Pickups for that. And, you know, one of the areas where they would like us to investigate putting their money to use for our patients is in the field of neuro restoration. Now, this means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of different ways where virtual reality uh, can be used uh, for restoring function in these patients and how to how we may be able to bring these things to Hogue for our patients. So, um, one of the biggest kind of areas for potential that's just becoming to be ex- being explored but has huge potential is in the impact of virtual reality for chronic pain. Um, there are several studies now uh, that, that uh, show decreased uh, pain scores, both in the acute and chronic pain setting, uh, for patients that have a virtual 
escape, if you will, um, while they're in the hospital or while they're in the rehab. Uh, and this not only directly correlates the decreased pain, uh, pain, both during and after the experience, but it's actually being tracked now to see if it decreases opiate consumption, which it, what, this is one of the things we're going to be looking to demonstrate. If we can demonstrate that you know, having a virtual vacation for 10 minutes in Bora Bora in a, in a, pre-operative, a post-operative patient decreases the amount of morphine that they use in the hospital after their surgery, that is a game changer. I mean, we're in this era where, you know, they told, all, they told us all 10 years ago, you guys are under treating pain. Pain is the fifth vital sign. Give them more morphine. Give them more opiates. Well, now we've all done that, right? Many people have done that. And look what's happened. You know, there's tens of thousands of people dying from the opiate epidemic. So we've got to reverse it. We've got to find a way to reverse it. Um, and we are actively looking for solutions. I think, from my experience with virtual reality, this is one potential card, one potential tool that we can use to help uh, with these patients. So um, we're going to be putting a proposal together in the next uh, month or so to try and bring uh, these VR systems to the hospital to bring to the patients after they've had a big spine surgery or a big abdominal surgery. And instead of getting their pain medication, they'll have an opportunity to say, you know what, I understand you're having an 8 out of 10 pain right now, Mrs. Jones. We have two options for you. Would you like to have a virtual trip to Bora Bora or would you like to have you know, morphine? Uh, and many of them may initially choose uh, to have, I mean, lots of our patients understand the opiate crisis and they don't, want to be, they don't want it. They don't want those medications. They want to try to avoid them as much as they can. So offering this as a potential alternative to an injection of an opiate uh, may be a great uh, solution to decrease the overall opiate consumption. We know if we can decrease the consumption, we can at least contribute to helping the solution for this obviously widespread problem. So one of the, um, one of the apps that's out there, one of the systems that's out there is something called Cool. I actually demoed this recently at the Healthcare Information Technology meeting. Um, and basically it's this beautiful, serene environment where you're kind of floating down a river um, and you know there's waterfalls and there's bubbles and it's snowing and it gives you tasks to do like feeding fish to the otters or collecting bubbles. I mean, these seem like kind of, you know, simple things, but if you're a post-operative patient and you're sitting there in your room and you're looking at the wall of the of the hospital room thinking about how much pain you're in and counting the seconds until the nurse comes in and gives you morphine, this may help distract you enough to get you through that wave of pain that, you know what, maybe you make it another hour without a Percocet. Maybe you make it a couple more hours without morphine. And overall, at the end, five days later, you've done this a couple of times, you used 30% or 40% less opiates. I cannot think that that's, that that's not going to, anything but that, that that's going to help contribute to our opiate uh, epidemic in this country. So I feel like this is one of the probably uh, most significant areas where using VR uh, and, and giving these opportunities to our patients as an alternative uh, may help uh, to, to uh, stem the tide. And then the other major area is in uh, VR and AR for neuro rehab. Uh, the, with the Olympics just having passed recently, even it was on TV now, lots of commercials showing people, you know, people that are unable to walk and then they put on a headset and they look down and, and they're able to kind of see their own legs moving in the rehab environment and it helps them to, to regain function. So that is, uh, we're just about to open the new neuro rehabilitation um, center here at Hogue. Um, and uh, I think the timing of this is really good. Uh, there's um, a, a proposal for us to be one of the pilot centers for this program called VR Health, where they have um, all different kinds of apps uh, which allow um, for balance, for training people that have problems with gait. They put on a headset and they, it simulates their uh, walking on a beach, so it's kind of an uneven environment. They, and what it does is, is kind of allows the brain to check in and learn how to adapt to these different environments. So while we can't actually travel to an area that has, you know, an uneven surface, we can certainly replicate that environment uh, in the rehab center. And there's, again, there's data behind showing these things, improving the ability uh, of patients to recover more quickly from strokes, to recover more quickly from spinal cord injury or from brain tumor surgery, uh, and get them back on their feet uh, and improve their quality of lives. Uh, So the application to both acute and chronic pain, as well as acute neuro rehab, I think has substantial potential benefit to our patients. So I'm excited about the possibility of, of getting some of these technologies going for our patients here at Hogue. Uh, and then finally, um, the kind of end of this, you know, the, the, where this has led me um, is, you know, in this kind of quest to find, basically train myself how to use augmented reality in the operating room, I ended up hooking up with the neuroscientists 
the team of neuroscientists at NASA, uh, and I became part of this group called the Deep Space Research Consortium, which is um, the group of uh, physicians and, um, and behavioral health professionals that are training the astronauts to go to Mars in 2030. So I've become part of this, group, this, this uh, collaborative consortium now, and what we're doing now, we have two proposals to send this system up to the International Space Station on the next supply mission. And the idea is that um, we take EEG-based biofeedback, um, where the patient puts on, the patient, in this case, the astronaut, puts on a, an EEG cap, that the, machine, the, the computer interprets that information and drives the content of what they're seeing. So the astronauts are away from their home and family for, for a year sometimes. When they're going to Mars, they're going to be away from their home and family for four years. You can't imagine the psychosocial stress that puts on them from being in an environment that is totally foreign. They have no gravitational cues. They have no natural sounds. They have no natural sights. There's no natural light. They're in a steel box, essentially, that is completely foreign to them. They can't see or talk to their families. And so if we're able to replicate them being in an area or an environment that is serene for them or that is calming for them or that is restorative for them using virtual reality, then we can get them back to doing what they need to be doing. We can keep them focused on their mission. So this initially started by a technique for using virtual reality to decrease reactivity in the brain. Like so to take someone that's really stressed, put them in a virtual meditative environment, they sit in the beach in Bora Bora for 10 minutes and they're calmer and they're able to return to their tasks. So it's evolved into taking that but having the content driven by EEG. So the, the, the computer is essentially reading their brain wa uh, waves. It is interpreting what this patient needs and where the, the, they may be overactive and is feeding them virtual content to help to decrease their reactivity of whatever system of their brain is, is out of balance. Uh, and we're hoping that we can demonstrate this concept on astronauts uh, and then be able to bring it back to patients that are in a normal everyday setting. And you know, if someone's going through a stressful day, one of the ways that we're going to be doing this is a concept that we're just about to launch here at Hogue is, is setting up these virtual reality meditation rooms for the nurses. So nurses, you know, throughout the course of the day, just like doctors, they experience extreme stress and we're kind of just taught to push it down and deal with it and sort it out. Well, sometimes that's not the healthiest way to do it. And if we can offer them a virtual escape on their floor, so we're trialing a pilot of this on 3 East where we're going to have two VR stations set up for the nurses and um, you know, throughout the course of their day during their break, they can go in and I've got a couple of different VR apps that they can, basically it's virtual reality meditation that you put them on a beach in the Caribbean somewhere and they're looking out and they, after 10 minutes, do they feel less anxious? Do they feel more at ease? Do they feel more able to take care of their patients? So um, th as you can see, the kind of spectrum of, of utility of virtual reality has kind of come full circle from you know, the aerospace industry, initially with the fighter jets, through neurosurgery into post-operative rehabilitation, and now into overall mental and behavioral health for both our patients and for our healthcare providers. And I think that you know, on the last part, you know, if we're going to continue to be a leader in caring for uh, patients here at Hogue, then we also need to be a leader in caring for our own healthcare practitioners, and that includes our doctors and our nurses, so that we can continue continue taking good care of patients. And uh, this is me and my little girl. Uh, only thing more important to me than my career is my, my little girl. <laughs> Thank you all. I can take your questions if you have any.